up with the idea of singing the doxology while you wash your hands, which is a great way to pray and also to be getting clean for coronavirus at the same time. So let's try it together, shall we? Welcome to First Church of Christ in Longmeadow in the United Church of Christ. I'm Pastor Marisa Brown Ludwig, and I'm happy to welcome you here to worship this morning. Merry Christmas. This is the first Sunday after Christmas. Across our social distancing during this quarantine time, we welcome you from wherever you are and however you are seeing us, whether live streaming on Facebook and YouTube or recorded later on LCTV. We are an open and affirming congregation that celebrates the extravagant welcome of Jesus Christ. And that means that you are welcome here no matter your age, your abilities, your economic status, the color of your skin, your gender expression, or who you love. In the United Church of Christ, we say no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Our Advent Christmas preaching series concludes today. It is I Believe Even When. Our series takes its name from the opening words of an anonymous Jewish poet scrawled on a wall during the Holocaust. I believe in the sun, even when the sun is not shining. I believe in love, even when I feel it not. I believe in God, even when he is silent. We have told the story throughout Advent and into Christmas of how Christ was born through the opening texts of all four Gospels. We have contemplated the themes of hope, love, joy, and peace. We have proclaimed the coming near of God in the birth of Christ and celebrated him with the shepherds and the angels. The good news that we have proclaimed for this Advent Christmas season ends with a second chapter of Luke that opens when the time came. And indeed, the time has come for us to move from the narrative of birthing to the narrative of redemption. The story of Jesus' ritual cleansing as a child contains stories of people who have been waiting for this moment. But the time of waiting is over for us, too. 
like Isaiah who says, for Zion's sake I won't stay silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I won't sit still. We will not stop our work for change in the world and in us until justice shines out like a light for us all. I believe in God. I believe in God, even when, even when God is silent. I believe in God. Holy One, we thank you for the glimpses we have caught throughout this season of Advent and Christmas of your gifts of hope, love, joy, and peace. Even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we have not been sure of tomorrow, you have ignited the light within us and we have glowed with its brilliance from the inside out. As is our first church tradition, we continue to watch the movement of the camels and the wise ones as they come from the back of the church to the front, from the east to Bethlehem. And we have another two weeks until they get there. So even though it's Christmas, we are still waiting for them to arrive. So let's see where they are today. My friends, Across the distances, I send you the peace of Christ, that it may fill your lives and spill out into the world around you. If you are with loved ones now, please won't you turn to them and offer them the peace of Christ? And I say to you, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And now, please join me in saying our opening prayer. The words will be on your screen. O star-flinging God, whose light dances across eternity. Dazzle us into your presence this new year. Open our hearts to the mystery of your love. Awaken us to your presence, knit to the ordinary. Reveal to us what is possible, but not yet present. Heal us that we might be healers. Reconcile us to you and to ourselves that our living might be reconciling. Stop us often, we pray, with news that is good, with hope, that holds, with truth that transforms, with a word tailored to this trail we're on. May the word of your grace guide our steps like the sun by day and the north star by night as we travel into the gift of the new year. Now won't you lift your voices with mine from wherever you are and sing our opening carol with us. You'll see the words on your screen.
O Holy One, may the light of your star illumine our hearts, that we may truly perceive your word in scripture, song, prayer, and preaching. Amen. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, through chapter 62, verse 3. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for my whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation, he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Here ends the reading. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Israel. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Here ends the reading.
want to focus on the text from Isaiah today. Isaiah says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. The exhilaration of these words belies their context. This is a shout proclaimed by a prophet in a time of desolation, when the people of Israel were still in exile in Babylon, believing that their God had been left behind when they were captured and brought out of the promised land, far, far away from Jerusalem and the place they believed was one with them. Isaiah speaks exuberantly, not just passionately, claiming return and revitalization will happen. God's promise will shine out. Nothing can stop the power of God, the prophet cries, not any earthly might. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent, the prophet cries. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. If we kept going beyond where the passage stopped for us today, the prophet says in verse 4, You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called. My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. Naming is a powerful thing. It's an identity we come to know in someone or some place. Names can set a vision before you, and they can also hold you back. When you think your identity means a certain limit, or says you can't or can be something, it often gets fixed deep inside you. Names can identify us with a person we're named after, and so we get a preconceived idea of what that means. But they can also describe a trait or character. Here in our reading, the prophet says Israel is called desolate and forsaken. And the people despair. But Isaiah says, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. And he proclaims return, redemption, and renewal that's going to be better than before. You shall be called. My delight is in her. Now, the names we call ourselves, the beliefs we have about ourselves, they hold on tight. They feel like who we are, unchangeable. But if this Advent Christmas message we've been hearing these past weeks has anything to tell us, it's about change and transformation, for nothing is impossible with God. That into the bleakest of places our God comes in tenderness and beauty, in healing and new life. Isaiah says, the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Here is what our God is saying to us. I will change your name shall no longer be called wounded outcast lonely or afraid I will change your name your new name shall be confident
old names hold on really tight to us. And there's a neurobiological reason why. And I've spoken of it before, but I'm going to say it again because you need to hear things many times for them to be something you consider true. An article in Forbes magazine looked at studies about first impressions. People form instant first impressions. We are hardwired to do this because our primordial brain is trying to determine friend or foe, fight or flight or freeze, potential mate or not, part of my tribe or not. Our conscious minds can handle roughly 40 bits of information per second. And that may sound like a lot until you consider that our unconscious minds can handle 11 million bits per second. We've evolved to let our unconscious minds handle first impressions, and so our minds get made up fast before we have a lot of information, and we don't even know why consciously. Marketing executive Jeff Goins says that our brains begin to go deeper only after the fifth time we encounter something. That's when we start to disprove our first impression. But often in our society, we make decisions based on that first exposure, an interview for a job, a one-time visit to a new church, a person we meet. But here's what marketing research shows. The first time you encounter a message, it doesn't change the way you already think. It doesn't matter how exciting or scary or new, it just doesn't stick. But somewhere after the fourth time you see it or hear it is when words and images begin to resonate. He says, transformation happens when you get to the fifth, fifth experience or more. So if you want to connect with something new, he says you must do three things. Show up, earn permission, ask for a second or third time to see or experience something, and then pay attention. Notice things more deeply about the person or the issue. Another marketer writes that he has found it takes 20 encounters to undo a first impression. So wow, that's a lot of exposure. So it may feel like change is not possible for us because after the first couple of times we give up. But that is simply not true. We have to focus on the change we want to have and return again and again to it before it will begin to stick and feel familiar and become our more natural reflex. The prophet says, the nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. Hear our Lord speaking to us again. your name you shall no longer be called wounded outcast lonely or afraid I will change your name your new name shall Now, I have increasingly experimented with this across the years with greater and greater success. And I have an example from this pandemic year. Growing up, I somehow took in the belief that I couldn't work with plants. Anything green I touched seemed to wither and die within a few weeks. I had heard my mom use the term about herself, I have a black thumb, when I was a child. And as I grew up, I thought, well, I guess I probably do too because I had some failed experiences, that was my first impression. So the name I had for myself was one who kills plants. I would try intermittently to revisit this 
when another plant would come that I really liked and maybe as a gift and I thought I'd try again, but inevitably the plant would die because I underwatered it or overwatered it or maybe I had it in the wrong spot. And these failed attempts just reinforced the belief I already had about myself, the name I called myself, the one who kills plants. Then I had been reading these neuroscience articles and I was increasingly pushing myself to challenge these kinds of names and beliefs. I really wanted to be someone who could grow things. And then in March 2019, during Lent, Marika and Doug Burt had set up a beautiful altar full of orchid display. As they were breaking it down for Easter, Marika handed me two orchids, a gorgeous full white one and a stunning pink purple one. I tried to refuse. I said, I'm not like you and Doug. I don't have a knack for this. I can't keep anything alive. But she persisted, and so I took them home. They were lovely for a long time, as orchids can sometimes do. And then the blooms began to drop off when their life cycle had ended, and they, they just had a few green leaves left, and I thought, well, here we go. But I was determined. I thought about a dear friend of mine who had been a wonder with orchids, my friend David Carlson from South Congregational Church in Springfield. He had been one of my support team at South while I was in seminary. Now, Dave could be blunt and rough, but he was fiercely dedicated to me and the church. And the first time I went to his home for a meeting and I saw his orchids, I was blown away. And I understood something about that man that I knew I wanted to be more like. In the center of his home was this large green, full greenhouse. It was full of orchids, lush and colorful, bold and abundant. And I knew there was something remarkable about him, that he could be sort of so prickly and rough on the outside and be so tender in the greenhouse. So nurturing. So when Marika gave me these orchids, I was determined to try better. I read up on orchid care. I learned how they grow and what the signs are that they are dormant but healthy how they send out these little air roots that take nutrients from sunlight and the air around them. I started to notice things about the plants in my house. I watched and I waited. Nothing. But they didn't die. So I thought that was a good sign. And then in August of 2019, our family went to visit my cousins in Maryland and they took us to their favorite botanical garden, Longwood Gardens in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. Maybe some of you have been there. It's an amazing place. It was a pilgrimage we had made before with them, but this time I found the orchid room. And there they were, the air roots in abundance, sticking out all over, sort of awkward and funny looking. I noticed them this time because I'd learned about them. The orchids were stunning and also funny looking. Many were blooming and many were not. I looked more closely. I paid attention, I watched, and I remembered. So when I went home, I did not give up. It had been six months by then, but I read more up on them, I tended them, I adjusted how I cared for them from uh, micro changes that I noticed, like when I watered them, when I didn't, how the leaves changed color or shape or their turning. Then in February of this year, 2020, suddenly, a shoot came out from one of them. And about a week later, a shoot came out from the other one. In March 2020, just as we were all locking down from the onset of the pandemic, the first blooms erupted. The changes came across a month at a time. First the white one, and then the pink one. And by May 2020, they were both in full, glorious bloom. They had more blooms than they'd had on them when I first got the orchids from Marika. They were my joy, and they shook me to my core. Because with a year of working on pushing aside my name, I had actually crossed that boundary. I was no longer the one who kills plants. I had become now the one for whom orchids bloom. I thought of Dave, who died in 2017. David, I said, look what's happened to me. 
you were probably laughing up there because you long ago unlocked how to do this, how to make orchids flourish. You have been my inspiration. Thank you. But something much more had happened besides this change, because I had learned that I could, in fact, slow myself down in a sustained way, that I could watch and pay attention and let the being in front of me tell me how to nurture it. I believe that this is the same quality that in David had made him such a tender mentor for me. And so increasingly, I've applied it to people, too. No two people are alike. Have you noticed? And if you want to make a connection, you know, it happens easily with some people, but not with everyone. So it pays to watch and to notice and then to teach from that watching. Teach yourself how to connect. Now, it's not as easy with people as perhaps with plants because plants stay with you where you put them so you can work with them. And people don't always. That's what free will is all about. But if they stick, around, then it's worth paying attention, giving it time, not letting your first impression stop you. David understood this, I think, and now a little bit more, I do too. But I'm living proof just in this small example of growing orchids. And now I'm really a believer that I can make change in myself of a bigger nature. And I believe that you can too. You have to survive the first four or more times of disbelief about yourself, of that first impression that sticks so solid in you, that rule about yourself you think is permanent. You have to latch on and persist. What is a part of yourself you'd like to change? What is a name you'd like to have that you don't? Take a moment and think of something right now, something that maybe you know bugs people about you who love you. Maybe it really bugs you about yourself, or maybe it's a quality that you admire in someone else and you think, I could never be like that. I'm not capable of that. Can you hear the name that you have for yourself versus the name that you want to have? Now, I challenge you to claim this change for yourself in the coming days. Over the hibernation time of winter, say it to yourself every day. I will no longer be called this. I will be called one who does this. Watch and notice people who have this quality and reinforce the change you want to see. Persist and don't give up, even if you don't believe that the change is possible. See what happens. Claim it for yourself like Isaiah did. Say it with a bolder and bolder voice. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silence. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her vindication shines out like the dawn and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication and all the kings your glory. And you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. I have a new name for you says our God. Can you hear it? Can you claim it? Go on now. Go forth and be made new. You have a new name. Amen. I will change your name. You shall no longer be called
Join me now in our litany of belief. Your part will be on the screen. In times when humanity disappoints, perhaps when even our own thoughts and behaviors disappoint, it is an important act to call out, name, and claim the consequences of our wrongs. And in a time of distress, it is a prophetic act to call out, name, and claim our belief in the promise of joy. So say with me now these statements of belief and may we claim them as our own. I believe that we have failed to see Christ and I believe that we can wake up and serve him by serving others. I believe that we have waited for someone else to rescue us and I believe that we can be the change we want to see. I believe that we have hidden the light for too long and I believe that the light can shine whenever we open ourselves to be Christ's presence in the world. We believe even when we are discouraged. We believe that when we are discouraged, raising our voices for justice will offer more hope, more love, more joy, more peace, and more light. Amen. time of prayer. So please go ahead and begin to share in the comments on both Facebook and YouTube the names of anyone or a world event or issue of our time that you would like to raise up in prayer. Please remember that this is a public forum, so first names alone are good. God knows us each and what we need. So now, let us come together in prayer. Lord of bright and abiding light, you have shown us in the person of Jesus, your son, a new way to live. You have poured out your light into the world and have asked us to live in the light rather than run and hide in the darkness of doubt or despair. 
You promise to be our light ahead of all our days and ask us to place our trust in you. The journey in this light is risky, and it means that we will have to be very serious about our service to you, giving you our best and offering hope and light to others. In this new year, we bring you the names and situations of others for whom light seems to be a stranger. They struggle with ill health, economic hardship, broken and damaged relationships, loss of loved ones, fearfulness, isolation. We place them in your care. Let your light shine on them, bringing healing and hope. Help us to be bearers of that light in all that we do. And now, at the close of the year, I invite us to hold in our hearts all who have died this year. I will be lighting a candle for them. So very many have died due to the coronavirus, but also to tragedy and violence, self-harm, addiction, illness. From where you are at home or in our comments, go ahead and say their names or keep them in the silence of your hearts. I will read the names of First Church members who have died in 2020. But first, I light a candle for yours and ours. Here are the names of ones we have said goodbye to, members and friends of First Church. Ellen High, who died December 26, 2019, and we buried February 1, 2020. Rooster Sturdivan, who died January 14, 2020. Patrick Coffey, who died April 26, 2020. Phoebe Wallace, who died June 17, 2020. Jean Frazier, who died June 17, 2020. Harvey Ploss, who died October 8, 2020. Marjorie Steiger, who died October 19, 2020. Charles Free, who died December 2, 2020. Including all the ones you have also lifted up. Let us say a prayer of release for them as we get to the end of this year. O oh God, and so we take the ragged fragments, the patches of darkness that give shape to the light, the scraps of desires unslaked or realized, the memories of spaces of blessing, of pain. And so we gather the scattered pieces, the hopes we carry, fractured or whole, the struggles of birthing exhausted, elated, the places of welcome that bring healing and life, and so we lay them at the threshold, God. Bid you hold them, bless them, use them. Ask you to tend them, mend them, transform them, to keep us warm, to make us whole, to send us forth. We release them to you. Another year has turned its page, O oh God. We feel promises about to be fulfilled and hopes that may be realized and sorrows unknown that may become ours to bear. We declare at the doorway of this new year that our trust is not in any man or woman or circumstance to fulfill us, nor a belief that the days ahead will be easy. We do not expect our every prayer to be answered in a way that we would like. You are in control, and we release our lives to you. We put our trust in this, that you who have been with us throughout this past year, Emmanuel, will be with us in this new year, too. With you, we walk by faith into this new year, and we pray for our families, our friends, our neighbors, our towns, our country, and our world. May the new year bring us closer to deep healing, peacemaking, and love for all of us. In your name we pray, living Lord Jesus. Amen. Will you say with me now the Lord's Prayer in the words that are most comfortable for you? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We come to the time of offering now, and we address our God. Lord Jesus, you showed us that nothing can stop your coming into our lives. If we but follow the star, to come and see. May we open our hearts wide to you and give now back to the world unafraid, trusting that the more we give, the more you will provide. So my friends, we invite you to continue to give as you are able to support the staff and ministries of this church, either by mailing your pledges and gifts into the church or by the electronic ways we make available to you now on our live stream broadcast. Please continue to give your time and your help to people in need throughout our community, your neighbors and your family. All these things together become our gifts offered up to God this day. Please join us in singing praise to our God through the doxology. prayer of dedication for our gifts. O God of new beginnings, may the light of Emmanuel, God with us, surround these gifts, bless them, and make them your healing presence in the life of the world. Amen. Now, I want to offer a family blessing. In past years when we were together, I invited you on the last Sunday of the year to come forth family by family for a blessing where I could lay hands on you and bless you together as a family. It was a New Year family blessing in honor of the Holy Family, a blessing for families of all kinds, including clusters of friends or even a family of one. But this year you will have to hold with you in your heart and maybe there beside you in your home all whom you call family, all who stand with you in this challenging life. And I will offer a blessing through our live stream now. So hold them that I may reach out my hands to you there. May God bless your family in all the seasons of life, surrounding you with the light that will never go out, the light of love. Amen. Now as our service draws to a close, here are some announcements about our church life this week. We will not be holding our regular church school now until after the new year, so no classes today or next Sunday, January 3rd. And then we will resume church school for grades kindergarten through 5th and our 6th and 7th grade class on Sunday, January 10th, Epiphany, between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on Zoom. All the classes will resume then. To register for any of our classes and programs or simply to find out more about them, please watch your weekly e-newsletter from us or reach out to us at office at firstchurchlongmeadow.org. In a moment, we will speak our Christmas benediction prayer. But before we do, I want to let you know that after we sing our closing carol, we will air a special video choir piece made by family of First Church. The daughter of Susan and Stephen Kennedy, Jennifer Kennedy Erdotti, directs music at UMC New Hampshire. We'll air a piece that she directed with her choir with visuals from the nativity scene of Susan and Steve. Please stay on to hear and see this wonderful performance. And next Sunday, January 3rd, Rabbi James Green will be our guest preacher. We look forward to having him with us. Now, my friends, our worship has ended. Thank you for being with us here today. Remember that I am here for you during the week. So if you need to reach me, you can call me at the church 
and I will get the message, or you can write to me at office at firstchurchlongmeadow.org. And now, on Christmas morning, we made room for the Savior in our hearts, and we praise you, O God, for coming near to us again. Holy One, in this new year, may we find courage and faith to proclaim the good news he came preaching to all the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we will have an interactive benediction prayer. Your words will be on the screen. Go in peace to all of you, knowing that the God whose love created this world came into this same world to be our friend, companion, and Savior, Jesus Emmanuel. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. A child is born to us. A son is given. He is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Christ is born. Happy New Year to all. Amen. And now we are ready to go forth. Won't you rise in body or spirit to sing out our closing carol, the words will be on your screen. Show us all. 
Господь, Господь.